What's up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Panisi, and today we're covering part two of how to periodize a training program for Supercross and Motocross. Let's do it. All right, welcome to part two of periodization for Supercross and Motocross. If you haven't listened to part one, I definitely recommend starting there and coming back to this one. Okay, so now we know exactly what periodization is and what it looks like. So why do we need to periodize for Supercross and Motocross? To help illustrate this point, I'm going to break down a typical 450 season in the Premier Class. All right, so let's say... The Supercross season for the 450 Premier Class will begin in early January. They will then have a competition almost every week for the next four to five months. At the conclusion of the Supercross season, they may get two to three weeks off, off, quotes, and then they go straight into the outdoor season, which will take them from late May to mid to late August. That's another three full months of competition almost every week. From there, there's a mini off-season for September. October has a bunch of off-season races, such as the Monster Energy Cup, Motocross and Nations, Red Bull Straight Rhythm, Geneva Supercross, Paris Supercross, etc. And then we've made it to November, in which case the start of the next Supercross season is a mere six to eight weeks away, and everyone starts training again. Holy cow. That's a full year. All right? You guys need to understand, you can't just train at 100% intensity in December and maintain that same intensity for the next 9 to 10 months. Something's got to give. If you don't plan for peaks and valleys, meaning you don't slow down to let your body recover in a way that doesn't affect your training, your body will force you to slow down when you get injured or sick. So how do we do that? What does that look like? Before we really take a a deeper dive, I want to remind you guys that the best program is written in pencil, not in pen. The program should change with the needs of the athlete, And there's no such thing as one size fits all. That being said, let's start with the off season. We've just finished up the last round of the motocross season. And for for simplicity's sake, uh, we're just going to say that we're not doing any off season races. All right. If you have questions about how to tackle straight rhythm in the Monster Cup, feel free to send me a direct message or an email. So now what? In the off season, we really only have one goal. Recover while maintaining a base level of fitness. This needs to be the psychological reset above all else, all right? If you want to train for fun, that's totally fine. And actually, I'd highly encourage it. But typically, during the off-season, I recommend that all of your activity be less scripted, all right? Go for a bike ride because you want to, not because you have to. Lift some weights with a friend because it sounds like fun and you know you're in good shape. You kind of want to show them up a little bit. Spend some time at the lake or the ocean, swimming, wakeboarding, kayaking, Go for a hike, whatever it may be. Just don't plan out a strict workout regimen and make it feel like you're training, all right? There needs to be a break. There also needs to be enough activity to maintain your base level of fitness. Honestly, just for the simple reason of it'll make your life much easier when training kicks off again in a few weeks. This is your chance to recover, have some fun, experience some normal life without all that training and traveling. So how long should your off-season be? Well... You always have to base your training periodization off of your next upcoming competition. So let's say the last round of outdoors happens in late August and Anaheim 1 is really early January. You've got probably somewhere in the ballpark of 18 to 19 weeks, give or take. A solid off-season for motocross would last probably four to six weeks. Now let me tell you why. Four to six weeks is enough time for a mental reset, but at the same time, It's not long enough for your body to lose all the progress you've made over the last year year or two, right? It leaves you right around 12 to 14 weeks to prepare for Anaheim 1. And this is the biggest reason, all right? In order to get through the four main periodization phases, that's before we hit maintenance mode, even with 12 weeks to train, you need to start a new block every probably two to three weeks. That is a narrow window. 
Now, depending on each athlete and their current training status, they may only need two weeks for the anatomical adaptation phase, and maybe they already have all the muscle they need, so they can shorten up the first and second phase and focus more on the third and the fourth. That's totally fine. But you need the time to be able to make adjustments. You need to be able to make that call. You never know. You could get one week into training, have a small little setback injury that doesn't allow you to train for a week. That's a big loss if you only leave yourself six weeks to prepare. All right, not to mention that results take time. I would much rather have too much time to prepare than not enough. All right, and the last reason for the four to six week off season is that you don't want to peak too early. If you start training right away in September, there's a good chance that you'll hit your stride too soon. Think back to Anaheim 1. Every single year, someone comes out swinging and dominates Anaheim 1. They had a great offseason, they're in great physical shape, and everyone else seems to struggle a little bit more than they do. But then you give it three to four weeks, and all of a sudden, everyone starts catching up in speed. They have just as good a fitness, and they start beating that person who was initially dominating. All right? Now... The person who was dominating wants to respond by training harder. You know, they're motivated, but they've left themselves no room to progress. Maybe they're even starting to feel the effects of burnout or they get injured because they're pushing too hard. It all goes downhill from there. I won't mention any specific names, but we see it every single year. I know you know who I'm talking about. Ideally, it should take you a couple races to really hit your stride and start feeling like your best. It's a long season. All right, that needs to show in your off-season and preseason prep. All right, off-season is coming to an end. It's early October. Time to get back to work. This is what we call the preseason. Our training is back to being structured. How much time you spend in each phase of periodization is highly dependent on the current training status of the athlete. All right, if you've done a good job maintaining your base level of fitness through the off-season, you may be able to get away with shortening the anatomical adaptation phase but I definitely wouldn't cut it out altogether. It's still a great way to get back into training without destroying your body, and the same goes for the hypertrophy phase. It's important to perform somewhat of a needs assessment moving into the preseason so that you have clearly defined goals, knowing what you need to get done. If gaining muscle isn't a huge priority, that can be reflected in how long you spend in this phase. The same goes for max strength. It's really tough for me, guys, to give you like definitive guidelines, as in, this is how long you should do this, and this is how long you should do it if this happens, etc. right? It all comes down to experience. And I know firsthand, it can be so frustrating to hear sometimes, but you just need to experiment and see what works for you. You can talk theory all you want, but it comes down to doing. It just takes time and experience. All right, let's move on. So we've had a great off season. We come back mentally ready to get back on the grind. Then we work our butt off through the preseason, We're in really good shape on and off the bike, and then the season starts. This brings us to that phase that I believe most people have trouble with, the maintenance phase. The trickiest thing about the maintenance phase is finding that balance of we're still pushing to get better each round without burning out or hurting the recovery process. I promise you it can be done, and as long as you remember that if you train hard, you also have to recover hard. Above all else, If you aren't recovered from the weekend of racing heading into the week, or you're not recovered from the week of training going into the weekend, you're in trouble. You can't keep pushing if your body is already struggling to keep up. That being said, there are a few guidelines that you can follow that should get you going in the right direction for the maintenance phase. Maintenance of maximum strength has to be given priority with regards to the gym training. Muscular endurance is going to suffer if your overall strength levels fall. It's important to remember that to some degree, You're still going to get muscular endurance when you're training on the bike, but the same can't really be said for maximum strength. I like to say there are a million different ways to skin a cat, but this is how I would personally structure a training program for the in-season. I would incorporate a minimum of two strength training sessions per week, each with probably 24 to 48 hours in between. We typically like to split it up as like a Tuesday-Thursday training day for the gym. All right, Of those two training days in the gym, One of them must be dedicated to maximum strength, and the other must be dedicated to muscular endurance. Which one you do first depends on the training preference of the athlete. I typically like to put the muscular endurance day first in the week, just because they come off the weekend, they're motivated, they're ready to get after it in the gym. And when we talk about these training days, I want one word and one word only to come to mind before anything else. 
efficiency. Riding is obviously the priority at this point in the season, and if there are improvements to be made, the athlete needs most of their energy for tactile and technical training, which is kind of a fancy way of saying on-the-bike skill. So when they do hit the gym, their sessions need to be short and efficient. As a general rule, each session should include slightly less volume than the preseason training, and the session shouldn't last more than, say, 30 to 45 minutes. An example of volume reduction would be if you're doing four sets of six reps during the preseason, you should shoot for two to three sets of five to six reps. For the endurance day, maybe instead of three sets of 20 reps, you do two sets of 20. All right. Depending on the recovery level of the athlete that week, the goal of the training session should not be to create more fatigue, but to stabilize performance and retain high performance output. Like I said in part one, it's so much easier to maintain strength and and muscular endurance than it is to build it from scratch. Generally speaking, almost all of your performance gains, I would say close to 85, 85 to 90% of your performance gains happen during the preseason especially for off-the-bike training. From then to the end of the outdoor motocross season, our only goal is to lose as little of those gains as possible. All right, so if you imagine a graph, your start point will be in the upper left-hand corner. And as time goes on without training, you'll see sort of a diagonal line from the top left to the bottom right, signifying you're losing strength, right? A steady loss in performance. Simply adding in two strength training sessions a week And focusing on recovery when you're not riding will flatten that curve in a big way, almost getting rid of the decline completely. But most training programs cut weight training to leave more energy for the riding and recovery cardio. Don't do that. I promise you'll regret it. All right, so let's talk about when we're starting to transition to the outdoor season. It should go without saying, if you're in the title hunt towards the end of the Supercross season, of course you need to stay in it. Outdoor prep should be kind of put on the back burner. It doesn't make any sense to risk a title for the fear of not being prepared for the next title, one title at a time. That being said, your team will want you to do some outdoor testing and whatnot, and that's totally fine as long as your mentality stays focused on the Supercross season. It's no secret you'll be coming into the outdoor season slightly less prepared than everyone who's not really in that current title hunt. Think back to 2018, Jason Anderson. He won the Supercross title, and... Going to the outdoors, he just absolutely wasn't a contender when the season started. He even openly said he was burned out. The Supercross season was so mentally stressful, and he spent most of his riding days on Supercross rather than motocross, he knew he wasn't prepared for the outdoors. However, this isn't isn't really always the case, because if you think back to Adam Sinsbrulo's last season on the 250 class, he was in the title hunt all the way until the main event in Vegas when he crashed and lost the title. But that heartbreaking defeat lit that fire, kept his drive alive, and that allowed him to go on and have the best season of his career, taking home the outdoor title. So if anything, I feel like this teaches us how unbelievably mental this sport is. Your ability to handle stress and fatigue will ultimately decide how well you do. You can have the best program in the world and the best trainer in the world, but unless you're a mental giant, you're not going to win. So the two to three week break between Supercross and Motocross you should try to find time for a mini off season, maybe like a week or so. Lots of active recovery, lower volume of training, you know the deal. This needs to serve as a mental reset. Aside from that, our plan of attack is almost identical to Supercross. Recovery is king, a minimum of two strength training sessions per week, one focused on max strength, one focused on muscular endurance. The only thing that really differs between Supercross and Motocross is the number of weekends that they take off from racing. This is a huge opportunity to maintain mental and physical wellness, and you have to take advantage of it. It's a long, long season, and whoever does the best job of managing their training load and mental wellness is likely to come out on top. All right, let's do a quick recap of the key takeaways for periodizing the Supercross and Motocross season. Enjoy a nice four to six week off season, lots of active recovery, enjoy normal life, Give your mind and body the rest it needs to get back to 100%. The preseason should be a minimum of 12 weeks, allowing you enough time to hit the first four phases of periodization. This is where a good 80 80 to 90% of your performance gains will come from. Hit the grind with a plan and hit it hard. The in-season forces us into maintenance mode, where 
The only goal is to not lose the strength and muscular endurance we've worked so hard to achieve while continuing to get better on the bike. Minimum of two strength training days per week, one focused on max strength, one on muscular endurance. Both days need to be short and efficient. If you're in the title hunt, stay in it. Your outdoor prep season may suffer, but you need to take it one title at a time. Try to find time for mini off season in between supercross and motocross for a mini mental reset and give your body a chance to recover. From there, apply the same basic principles from the supercross training block to make it the rest of the way through the outdoor season. The guy who can manage their training load and mental wellness the best will end up coming out on top. Just remember guys, not every week will look the same. You'll make a plan, change it, and change it some more. Focus on the big picture and try not to get so caught up in the details. The best athletes and coaches are able to continually adapt their current situation in terms of what's best for the athlete's wellness. There is not one right way to do this, and there's definitely no best way to do it. Just find what works for you, be consistent, and train hard. You have to believe in your program. Also, it's important to focus on building year after year. It rarely happens that an athlete is kind of subpar one year and then all of a sudden the best of the best the next season. All right, These types of transitions take years, not months. The best training programs build month after month, but also year after year. Try to think long term and make sure that at the start of every season, you're not only better from a few months ago, the off season, but you're also in a better place than last year's start of the regular season. All right, year to year building. All right, guys, that'll pretty much do it for today's episode. Please remember that there are a million different ways to get the job done. This is just the model that I found the most success with and makes the most sense given the situation. I know that this was a lot of information thrown at you. So if anybody out there would like to talk more with me about this, please send me an email or a direct message on Instagram. There's nothing I love more than talking about motocross training. All right. If you find anything I said today helpful or you just like hearing me talk about things related to motocross training, please take 30 seconds, leave a review, share this podcast with one person who you think would enjoy it. I'm doing my best to help elevate the sport of motocross. And together with your support, I really believe we can change the sport for the better and help the world realize just how elite motocross is. See you guys next time. 